Good morning. I am Dr. Prachi Saxena, Assistant Professor in the Department of Respiratory Medicine at Santosh Deem to be University, Ghaziabad. And uh, today, the topic of my lecture is Extrapulmonary Tuberculosis Part 1, in which I will be discussing about pleural effusion and tubercular empyema. So basically, tuberculosis can affect any part of the body. It could be either a primary infection or a secondary infection due to reactivation of latent disease. In case of extrapulmonary tuberculosis, the latter, that is reactivation of latent disease, is much more common. Pleural effusion is believed to occur secondary to the rupture of a subpleural caseous focus in the lung. As you can see, this is the uh, gone focus area or the area where tuberculous infection is most common, which is in the lower part of the upper lobe or the upper part of the lower lobe. Effusion occurs when such focus ruptures into the pleural space, which is the space between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura and causes a hypersensitivity reaction with the collection of the fluid. So, as previously discussed, that the most common pathogenesis of a pleural effusion is a rupture of a focus which allows the tubercular protein to enter the pleural space and generate hypersensitivity reaction. These are most commonly type 4 hypersensitivity reaction or the cell-mediated hypersensitivity reaction. In some cases, pleural effusion may also be seen as a direct contiguous spread of the disease to the pleura or by a hematogenous spread. This is most commonly seen in immunosuppressed individuals like HIV infected or severely diabetic or suffering from chronic renal failure. Occasionally, it can also occur as a complication to thoracic vertebral tuberculosis with paravertebral cold abscess. Tuberculosis or sciitis of the rib may also be associated with pleural effusion. TB pleuritis has recently been described in terms of a three-stage pattern of cellular and granulomatous tissue reactions. So these are basically the steps in pathogenesis by which the pleural fluid is included or the pleural fluid is infected. Neutrophils are the first cells which respond to the mycobacterial protein. Macrophages predominate in the pleural fluid from the second to the fifth day and it is the lymphocytes which form the prominent cell in the pleural fluid in the later stages. These lymphocytes are mostly T cells which comprise of CD4 helper T cells as well as a CD8 cells. But the ratio of CD4 cells is much more as compared to CD8 cells. What are the clinical features of TB pleuritis? Tuberculous pleural effusion is typically a disease of young men. They usually present with non-productive cough, two-thirds of them, and pleuritic type of chest pain. Pleuritic type of chest pain is typical, which is a sharp stabbing chest pain, which is aggravated on deep inspiration or on coughing. The patient is usually febrile, but absence of fever does not rule out the disease. There are episodes of evening rise of temperature or in case of secondary infection, there could even be uh, chills, fever with chills. Other systemic manifestations include night sweats, weakness, weight loss, anorexia and fatigue. These systemic manifestations are common to usually all forms of tuberculosis. Non-specific signs of pleural effusion include dullness to percussion and occasional demonstration of pleural rub at auscultation. When the, we uh, take our clinical classes for the students, we explain all these things in detail that what are the findings of a pleural effusion on inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation of the respiratory system. So how do we investigate for a suspected case of pleural effusion? The initial investigation of choice is of course a chest x-ray. 
Tuberculous pleural effusion is unilateral in more than 90% of cases and it is usually small to moderate in size. In up to half of these patients, coexisting parenchymal disease can be demonstrated by conventional chest radiograph. So as you can see in this uh, picture, there is some amount of homogeneous opacity which is occupying the right middle and the right lower zones of the plain chest radiograph causing the blunting of the costophrenic angle. The costophrenic angle is this angle as you can see on the left side which is formed by the diaphragm and the internal costal margin which is usually sharp in normal cases but in a case of pleural effusion these uh, this costophrenic angle is obliterated and in this case we can see it is a moderate sized pleural effusion. CT scan is much more sensitive than chest radiograph which shows parenchymal disease in over 80% of cases. Almost half of these patients have smooth pleural thickening exceeding 1 cm on a thoracic CT. So basically the advantage of a uh, computerized tomogram is that it gives you a three dimensional picture. Sometimes we might uh, suspect a mild or a minimal amount of pleural effusion on a chest x-ray but on a CT scan due to a three dimensional picture we are able to see much more fluid which has collected in the uh, costovertebral gutter as well as the uh, posterior part of the pleural space. Also CT scan gives us a huge advantage on seeing the underlying lung parenchyma as it is visible over here. Some amount of infiltrates or nodular shadows are also seen in the lung which gives us an indication that the uh, pulmonary parenchyma is also involved. Another investigation of choice is the thoracic ultrasonography which may detect much smaller effusions. They, uh, the advantages are they have, uh, they give us a more precise volumetry than chest radiography. But they help us in localization of septae which can be seen floating or adhered to the uh, pleural space, membranes and pleural thickening. So this flowchart basically gives us an approach to a unilateral exudative pleural effusion. It is important here to know that exudative or transudative pleural effusion we decide by the lights criteria that is if even if one criteria is fulfilled that is a pleural fluid protein uh, which is greater than, uh, than the serum uh, protein uh, by the ratio of 0.5 or pleural fluid LDH is more than 0.6 uh, when we divide it by the serum uh, LDH or the uh, pleural fluid LDH is more than two-thirds of the upper limit of the serum LDH, then that classifies it as an exudative pleural effusion. So a uni if we get a case of a unilateral exudative pleural effusion, we have to perform a diagnostic aspirate. If we perform a diagnostic aspirate, we have to send it for cytology or AFB and or PCR, which is also known as CBNAT. If it is negative, we have to undergo for a uh, cytology for malignant cells also. If malignant cells are negative, more of lymphocytic predominant, we suspect tuberculosis. Ideally, they should undergo a pleural biopsy or an ADA. If pleural biopsy is uh, diagnostic of a granuloma or AFB or the ADA is uh, reasonably high, then there is a strong suspicion for making a diagnosis of TB pleural effusion. So this is the basically the approach we form for a exudative pleural effusion and this is the side we follow for tubercular pleural effusion. So what does the pleural fluid analysis reveal? You have now got a patient whom you suspected to have a pleural effusion. Now you have done the x-ray, you have done the routine blood investigations and now you have tapped or you have taken out some amount of pleural fluid for analysis. So if it is a tubercular pleural effusion, we basically see a straw colored or a serous or a serosanguinous exudate. And when we perform the biochemistry, we see that the pleural fluid protein level exceeds 5 gram per deciliter. When we see the differential of the cytology, 
we see that the fluid fluid differential count is more than 50% lymphocytes. Usually we see lymphocytes as high as 80% to 90% in patients who are having tubercular fluid perfusion because as told in the pathogenesis, the CD4 helper T cells are the predominant cells or the predominant heartbringer of the hypersensitivity in tubercular fluid effusion. The fluid ra rarely contains more than 5% of mesothelial cells. The presence of eosinophils in a significant number makes the diagnosis of TB unlikely except in cases having a hydronemothorax or due to a previous thoracocentesis. <laughs> So, there is a role of uh, the uh, value of measuring ADA in the plural fluid. ADA stands for adenosine deaminase and uh, there are many types available out of which ADA2 is the most specific for making a diagnosis of tubercular fluoral effusion. It is an enzyme involved in the purine catabolism and it catalyzes the deamination of adenosine to inosine or of deoxyadenosine to deoxyinosine. It appears that plural fluid ADA in excess of 70 international unit per liter is highly suggestive of TB pleuritis, whereas a level below 40 international units per liter virtually rules out the diagnosis. So it is not a very uh, specific uh, investigation for the diagnosis of TB plural effusion, but a reasonably high level of above 40 international units per liter gives you a fair chance of making a confident diagnosis of TB plural effusion. As previously told that there are several isoforms but the prominent ones are ADA1 and ADA2. In and TB plural effusion it is the ADA2 which accounts for approximately 90% of the total ADA activity. Now, this is the gold standard investigation for making a diagnosis of TB pleural effusion in which we take a piece of the parietal pleura in uh, under vision if, it, if we are doing a you know, thoracoscopic guided biopsy or a blind if we are uh, going uh, through uh, the Abraham or the Pope's needle. So, a closed parietal pleural biopsy can be performed using an Abraham or a Pope needle and in this, in the immunohistochemistry, if we demonstrate a parietal pleural granuloma and it is highly suggestive of TB pleural effusion. Mycobacteria can be cultured from pleural biopsy specimen in 33 to 80% of cases. When the culture of biopsy specimen is combined with microscopic examination, the diagnosis can be established up to 95% of instances. Thoracoscopy is a later, latest development in the diagnosis of a undiagnosed pleural effusion in which we insert a choker and a cannula and under vision we see the uh, condition of the parietal pleura and we take a guided biopsy by a biopsy forceps. It is considered the gold standard procedure. So, thoracoscopic guided pleural biopsy is the gold standard procedure for the diagnosis of TB pleuritis. It is characterized by grayish white granulometer covering the entire parietal and diaphragmatic pleura and in particular the costovertebral gutta. CBNAT has also been used to detect mycobacterial DNA in pleural fluid. Its sensitivity in the diagnosis of TB pleural effusion ranges from as low as 17% to as high as 100%. So as you are aware that in the diagnosis of uh, pleural effusion, CBNAT or uh, the demonstration of AFB is very less that the sensitivity ranges from 30% to as high as 100%. If we are able to demonstrate AFB, nothing like it. But because TB pleural effusion is more of a hypersensitivity reaction, it is very difficult to demonstrate AFB in CBNAT or in cultures. So our basic aim is a clinical, radiological and pathological correlation in making a diagnosis of TB pleural effusion. So, highly suggestive clinical signs, radiology, which are specific for uh, pleural effusion, unilateral. Then, uh, as we can see, there are septations formation of uh, some amount of pleural thickening. Then in pathology, if we see there are, uh, you know, high ADA, lymphocytic predominant. And in some cases, if we are able to demonstrate AFB. 
and the gold standard being the demonstration of granulomata in a pleural biopsy which could be a closed pleural biopsy blind procedure or a thoracoscopic guided pleural biopsy then we can make a confident diagnosis of a tb pleural effusion now coming to the treatment the goals of therapy in patients with tb pleural effusion are prevention of subsequent development of active tb as i have uh, already told in my first slides that tb pleural effusion most commonly occurs as a reactivation of a latent tb focus so by giving the anti tubercular treatment we are preventing the subsequent development of active tb which can uh, present as an active pulmonary tuberculosis or active extra pulmonary tuberculosis elsewhere in the body relief of symptoms and limitation of pleural fibrosis these are the three major aims or the goals of instituting anti tubercular therapy in patients patients with tb pleural effusion respond well to treatment with standard short course att and dots is preferred uh, dots stands for directly observed treatment short course which is given under the national tuberculosis elimination program evidence regarding efficacy of systemic corticosteroids in treatment of tb pleuritis remains insufficient there are uh, tb pleural effusion per se is not an ab absolute indication for the institution of systemic corticosteroids however in some cases where there are extensive adhesions being suspected or there are there is a massive amount of pleural effusion in some cases depending on the clinical judgment a short course of steroids lasting from 7 to 14 days can be given to uh, increase the resolution or uh, decrease the formation of adhesions or septations in the pleural fluid in some patients coming to the next topic short topic which is tubercular empyema empyema is basically collection of pus in the pleural cavity in some cases where pleural effusion remains undiagnosed or it gets secondarily infected patients can also present with tubercular empyema it is a distinct entity and it is much less common than tb pleural effusion it is characterized by chronic active mycobacterial infection of the pleural space this is how this is where it differs from the tb pleural effusion pleural effusion is mostly a hypersensitivity reaction to the mycobacterial protein while tb empyema is active mycobacterial infection of the pleural space that is why it is seen more commonly amongst the immunosuppressed like people living with hiv aids with chronic renal failure patients or receiving some amount of long term immunosuppressive treatment it usually represents the failure of a primary tb effusion to resolve and its subsequent progression to chronic suppurative form it may develop in fibrous scar tissue resulting from pleurisy artificial pneumothorax or thoracoplasty here how how does it differ actually when you aspirate a tb uh, empyema you will see usually frank pus or a highly turbid uh, fluid to be tapped which is difficult to aspirate by a small bore needle when you give it for cytology the cell counts usually exceed a lakh and virtually all cells being neutrophils see here the difference that because it is a active in, it is an active infection so the primary cells are neutrophils as compared to lymphocytes in tb pleural effusion the pleural fluid glucose is usually low uh, as low as 20 mg per deciliter with a high protein concentration of more than 5 g per deciliter and is acidic ph is usually less than 7.2 anaerobic and aerobic cultures should also be performed to exclude concomitant bacterial and mycobacterial infection here the principles are different the primary aim is pleural space drainage because active pus anywhere in the body has to be drained so pleural space drainage is of prime importance and antimicrobial chemotherapy which has to include antimicrobial if some organism is grown besides mycobacteria and directly observed short term treatment for anti tubercular uh, therapy pleural drainage is indicated for large empyemas and mixed empyemas especially if there is a bronchopleural fistula so bronchopleural fistula is basically an abnormal communication between a bronchus and the pleural cavity chest tube drainage can be done with or without installation of a fibrinolytic agent so we basically insert a wide bore chest tube which helps us in draining the pent up pus and if there is a 
bronchopleural fistula it also releases the air which is collected in the pleural cavity as a part of uh, hydronemothorax or pyonemothorax and with uh, we can instill fibrinolytic agents like uh, streptokinase alteplase and urokinase if uh, the patient has presented to us within first 4 weeks of the presentation of symptoms because that is when the adhesions are more amenable to adhesiolysis by a fibrinolytic agent in very long standing cases we have to uh, you know take the patient for surgical treatment the indications for surgical treatment are pleural thickening loculated empyema non expansion of lungs with intercostal drainage and a bronchopleural fistula the surgeries of choice are video assisted thoracoscopic surgery that is wax it is done by a thoracic surgeon it is effective in lysis of adhesions in multi loculated effusions and removal of fibrinous material from the pleural cavity open decortications are also done in patients with significant pleural thickening which allows the expansion of the lung so that finishes my presentation and in case of any doubts i am available for taking questions thank you